Good evening, friends. Once again, this January 8th, 2022, where we display that our selection bias is probably far superior to their selection bias. And that's kind of what it's all about with all this research going on and all the studies coming out, you know, as far as conflicting studies. But let's look at a nice little scatter matrix here. What do we have here? These countries, I should say, we look at right here, are the countries which are heavily vaccinated. And I don't really have to use any words, but do you potentially see a pattern here between, we look at the x-axis here, new cases smooth per million. And if we look at our y-axis right over here, people fully vaccinated per 100. And what do you notice? Now, there could be confounding other factors involved, but that's quite interesting. Now, let's move up just a little bit, and then we'll start looking at some of our uh, more intriguing studies real fast. And I want to show you real fast that we go to do, 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 fully vaccinated per 100 population uh, per cases per million. And, of course, here is our line once again. And once we break past that 60 line, that 60 people fully vaccinated per 100, Look at this and look at the rest of the world. Now that could be confounding involved again, but again, we could be displaying a high level of selection bias based upon not having everything in full context. However, though, until I hear a better explanation, uh, you pretty much can just say that VE, vaccine effectiveness, at least against the Omicron, uh, is more than worthy of question. All right, now let's look at some of our research articles too. Oh, ooh, wait one second, one second, one second. Let's go right here. Bah, bah, bah. Check this out. This is a good, good, uh, wonderful textbook example of a selection bias as well. So again, taking working within the context that we have doesn't mean there's not other mitigating factors. I always want to keep an open mind. All right, what do you notice here? The blue line our schools which required masks. Orange line, mm, so on and so forth. Maybe they take them off during lunchtime or whatever it is. And the red line is schools obviously which had few and no mask rules. And what do we have here? Is that blue line actually showing more cases per million than the red and the orange line along school aged children? And this comes from michigan.gov. And the thing that amazes me the most, regardless of the data being right in front of an individual's face, it doesn't mean the mask maybe didn't have work at this point in time or not. I don't know. But it could be also that Omicron is a smaller micron size, or it could be that there's four mites, it connects to surfaces more available, whatever, transmission rates, you know, it could be a ton of different reasons. But whatever it is, it not only appeared to have pierced the inevitable claim protection of certain inoculations, it also seems to really um, not work there either. And the thing that amazes me the most, regardless of the visual data which is available, I love that one line. That is just amazing. It remains important to mask up indoor settings, even though. You know, the, the thing that's kind of interesting about this, regardless of the mask thing, and I hate bringing it up again, but it seems like it's surfacing again, is it was interesting because a lot of major institutions said, hey, the masks work well in a lab setting, but in real world settings, it's not showing to have that impact. And, and therefore, then it just vanished. And what they decided to do is they decided to say, all right, well, we're not going to, we're not going to do counter studies to validate one way or the other. Uh, we're just going to keep on saying they work and they work 100% and da 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 And uh, then what ended up happening is all the research, for example, like remember the MIT research and indoor transmission and things like that, or the mask and the gaps on the side or, or the micron size being smaller and smaller or, or aerosolized. They just decided to say, hey, we'll just keep on saying the same thing over and over and over again. And then the studies and we're referenced the efficacy of the mask went away because how, how many times can you keep on studying the same subject? And then the mantra, though, stayed and have forth, even though you have visual data like this right before our eyes. Voila, you have this. 
All right, then also too, let's just get this out of the way as well, real fast. And da -da -da. what's this say? Nationwide study finds no significant link between in-person schooling and COVID infection rates. Does it say anything else down below here by any chance? Yeah, I think that pretty much says it is all. And of course, I'll have all the links available. And once it's rendered to 4K, uh, we'll bookmark it. But yeah, intriguing, isn't it? But let's look at what we're going to cover. P proceed as follows. A lot of good stuff out there uh, in reference to helping people, which is the most important thing. Lactobacillus probiotic uh, versus placebo and COVID-19. Um, curcumin. Curcumin. Uh, seem to have a very positive effect as well. I apologize not having it in place right off the bat. Uh, then we have intense meditation. Uh, now, I'm not a meditation person. In fact, I'm like, you know, I, I am not just the way I am. I like movement and stuff like that. But however, though, that's my bias. But And also as well, this is pretty amazing. If you weren't a meditation person before, uh, this uh, research article from University of Florida may end up changing it. You know, kind of almost changed my mind as well, too. And not about the fact of meditation, as far as making me want to sit still for a while and meditate. It's intriguing. All right, then as follows, too. Um, up from the Daily Mail. Let's get this out of the way real fast, too, because Daily Mail is pop-ups galore. All right, here we go. This is real intriguing. And once I get to the spot we're looking for, I will stop. Da, da, da. Check this out. Let's go to the headline. Could Omicron be even less deadly than seasonal flu? Scientists believe ultra-infectious strain may kill 100 times fewer people. May kill 100 times fewer people. It's an interesting way of having the wording. Than Delta. And mortality rates, or I should say 100 times less lethal than Delta. Uh, already similar to influenza before a variant emerged. Now, let's break down. Uh, there should be a section right here, which kind of is important. Keep in mind this term right here. Infection fatality rate. And give it a second for more ads to pop up and football things and everything else like that. Let's just get this highlighted real fast before it fades on us. So just remember that word infection infection fatality rate. And let's try one more time. Just to highlight. Yeah, pop-ups are wonderful, aren't they? All right, and then basically here we go. And it's not coming up. But here we are. Check this out right over here it is there if omicron let's just highlight that way then if omicron is 99 percent less lethal than delta it suggests that the infection fatality rate right there could be as low as 0 0.0025 percent the equivalent of one in forty thousand. although experts say this is unlikely instead the washington model worst case scenario per se estimates the figure actually sits in the region of 0.07%, meaning approximately 1 in 1,430 people who get infected will succumb to the illness. And this is where it currently stands right now, and that's with, obviously, with Delta and Omicron competing, and Delta obviously being more of a bully. And there's your flu. And so you really have to ask yourself the question is, when of all these social engineering up uh, experiments going to end in reference to lockdowns and so on and so forth and when does the where does that gray area disappear between trying to protect people and just trying to be oppressive or whatever you want to call it or just superfluous actions from paranoid bureaucratic establishments or Bureaucrats, which were inflected with Munchausen disorder, or whatever you want to call it, but still, there's got to be a, there's got to be a line drawn because obviously at this point in time, it just basically it's I say it's my way, or you don't go out to the store and buy groceries. All right, I'm going to close this out. I'll have the link for this as well too, so if you want to research the article, and I have to give uh, credit to the Daily Mail because they actually did the research in reference to this, and um, and they did a decent job. And so let's proceed forward. All right, then. We will look at doo -doo -doo, simple pH adjustment may enable or prevent COVID-19 nasal and throat spray. Now, it's not the pH adjustment itself. It is the niclosamide. And that looks extremely promising. 
then booster dose of mRNA is required for immune protection. Uh, let's get this one out of the way real fast because it just says right off the bat. The results of the study reported in the journal Cell indicate that traditional dosing regimens, I would want to say regime because obviously we're all living in someone's regime right now, of COVID-19 vaccines available in the United States do not produce antibodies capable of recognizing and neutralizing the Omicron variant. And obviously you already got to the end of the story here. Booster dose is needed for some sort of immune protection, but however though, questions are a reference to how long it lasts and are the antibodies themselves gonna actually offer adequate protection against the, um, the Omicron. All right, proceed forward. Then we go, boom, boom. Considerable escape of SARS cov 2 uh, Omicron to antibody neutralization. We'll look at that as well. Then we just did this as well, and this came from Michigan.gov. Uh, we just went through Binghamton University, and we looked at that as well, saying that all of what we're doing was in vain. Uh, and the problem is, again, it's it becomes like, and it, it almost feels like it's in, I don't know if maybe to me, I don't know if it does to you as well, uh, like a game of ego where, you know, I'm not wrong and I'm going to keep on doing this way regardless of what any sort of science presents. And also too, keep in mind, I want to use the word selection bias for those not familiar is I'm cherry picking data. And we've been doing this for quite some time. And cherry picking data means I'm looking at data that could basically fulfill my bias. And my bias in this case is my suspicions. And my suspicions, and your suspicions probably as well, um, have pretty much been far more accurate than theirs. And our suspicions now are, are basically science-based. Their suspicions appear now to be more superstitious-based. And that's just the way it is, and bottom line. All right, and so we went through this. We have to read through the article again. Headline says most of it does it regardless. Discordant SARS-CoV-2 test. We're going to show you the accuracy of the rapid test, and um, and another superfluous mitigation strategy that basically is totally more dangerous to implement than actually to um, not. And we'll go into how accurate that is. You'd be quite surprised. Then we'll go to, and this is just more the detail of the full study. There, the little triangles there. That's you follow a line that's the same person. And the red obviously means false negative. And then obviously what happens five, four days later? They're positive, but they were infectious. Wait, we'll go to that in a second. All right, then after that, we're going to COVID-19 Omicron resistant to most mono, mono, monoclonal, monoclonal antibodies, but neutralized by a booster dose. Once again, what is considered fully vaccinated? And the weird part about it, even if you're double vaccinated, you expect to have something. And uh, at least against this particular variant, you know, Omicron, uh, wow. All right, here it goes. Um, something to look out for. We're not, we won't cover this again. Uh, I just had this up because we noticed some, some weird effects that they need to be validated. Um, uh, but mild pancreatitis appears to be something new as far as a signal, just to keep an eye out on. Uh, we won't have to come back to that. I'll have the links regardless. All right, then auxiliary lymphadenopathy. Lymphadenopathy. All right, we're going to come back to this as well. The, the clinical trials were like way off, way off. They said lymphadenopathy, bleh, auxiliary, was only present anywhere from 3 to 16% of the, uh, the reactions which uh, people were vaccinated. And I'll give you a little insight just ahead of time. When they did ultrasound, 49% of the individuals uh, which received uh, particular vaccines uh, actually had, were diagnosed with lymphadenopathy, 49%. And this tells you how way off the clinicals can be because sometimes you're not expecting to see something and they decide to expand on a little bit more because they're trying to figure out how come uh, uh, mammograms and some cancer screening and things like that were coming out uh, with tons of red flags. Well, guess what? There you have it. And we'll get back to this in a second as well. Then, too, 
Babies born during the pandemic's first year score slightly lower in developmental screening uh, tests. Uh, this is important from Columbia University because it correlates with the research that was earlier uh, this, this year, uh, which was uh, basically from um, October of 2021. In finding those initial cognitive findings were actually quite dramatic. So this study from October, we'll look at it again a little bit later, is going to correlate with this study here from January. So I like redundancies in research, especially when they're done by two t totally separate institutions that are not uh, being biased by each other's research. Kind of like a lot of the inoculation research we're looking at, uh, and as well as facial coverings, uh, a lot of the stuff that pur purported the benefits were based upon other research and then you have a chain effect. So if one thing's wrong, then the outcome being presented by another research article may be incorrect. These are two separate, so independent, which is important. All right, then uh, Black Queen. All right, we'll look at this in a second too. We'll come back to this. Now let's get out of the way. Uh, Black Queen, you have two things in interesting as far as um, viral evolutions. Black Queen is basically where it's the opposite of Red Queen. Red Queen is you have to evolve or die. All right, so you have to keep on evolving. And that's a, a typical hypothesis. But back in 2011, the hypothesis kicked in in reference to the Black Queen, where you can you can de-evolve, so to say. Let's, let's, let's take, for example, let's take vaccination, for example. Uh, human population may represent the Black Queen very, very effectively, as well as uh, SARS-CoV-2. What it does is it finds out that, that it could find another organism or another aspect of the community which can basically uh, serve the same purpose. So in order to uh, basically conserve resources or to focus resources on other areas, it uses that part of the community. Uh, and and basically stops trying to do it on its own. So let's say, for example, you don't want to be healthy or you're not trying to have pick up healthy behaviors. Uh, you're eating tons of junk food, ultra processed foods. So your immune system is not there. So instead of relying upon your own immune system, you want to rely upon inoculation or face coverings or anything else like that to basically help uh, give your immune system a, a better shot at fighting off whatever it is, as opposed to basically the Red Queen hypothesis where if you did not have the inoculation or the face mask uh, and you're exposed to the same viral contagion, you, you want to evolve and adapt and develop an immune system that can properly adequately fight it on its own without the assistance of the Black Queen model of potentially relying upon a state-sponsored uh, immune uh, mitigation strategy. All right. And then, of course, the data sources as follows is VAERS, GIS Aid, uh, Our World in Data, and great, great, great sources. All right, so let's begin with our research as follows. Daily lactobacillus probiotic versus placebo in COVID-19 exposed household. I hate when that happens. Now I can go away. There. Exposed uh, contacts, protect, or randomized clinical trial. I like randomized clinical trials. Still susceptible to confounding, but still just the same. Better than not randomized. Emerging evidence suggests susceptible success suggests susceptibility to infections, including respiratory tract infections, may be reduced by probiotic interventions. Remember in the beginning when this all began, they couldn't figure out whether it was massive gastrointestinal upset and so on and so forth, and then that just kind of faded into the background. Well, some researchers hooked on to they keep on going. Therefore, probiotics may be a low risk widely implementable modality to mitigate risk of COVID-19 disease, particularly in areas with low vaccine availability and or uptake. And so proceed down. Remember, this is not really, this is no longer about the vaccinated and unvaccinated. This is about the immune and the not so immune. And that's where the whole argument should consist in. Hopefully the Supreme Court, which I've heard some of the dumbest, I apologize, forgive me, uh, most misguided arguments I've ever heard some of the Supreme Court judges say in reference to whether uh, inoculations or medical treatments should be mandated. Um, really weird. Um, but again, you and I are out there 
and hopefully we follow the Red Queen hypothesis. All right, here we are. Participants took LGG or placebo, that's lactobacillus ruminus, GG, uh, once daily for 28 days, starting from the receipt of the blind, the blinded ship study package. So they just shipped them a, <laughs> you imagine someone, they're going to ship you a box, whatever inside the box you got to take. All right. And of course, I don't do sponsors, so, but there it is. And I don't care because if, if it helps you, it helps you. That, that's all that matters. Contain 10 billion colony forming units of lactobacillus ruminus GG. And that's the strain. And so really, really kind of cool. And so let's scroll down. Whoops, there's that. Ba -ba -ba, ba -ba 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 -ba. And wow, graphics card is running really slow. Let's go to basically what we're here. In conclusion, COVID-19 continues to pose unique and novel challenge. It's not even the same COVID-19 anymore. It should just like change the year. It should be COVID-20, COVID-21, COVID-2022. Because, I mean, we don't even have D614G, if any of you remember what that was initially. Uh, even circulate anymore. And of course, and we had alpha, then we had beta, then delta, and now ami. You know what I mean? So it's like, and it's so different. Uh, that, 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 that's why the vaccines, it's like, it's like saying, you know, the vaccine was developed for 614G. All right, so pretend that's like a carpenter tool, say it's like a saw. And you need that saw to cut wood. Beautiful. But now we're past the saw part, and we have to, we have to basically we have to uh, hammer in a nail, but we're trying to hammer in a nail with a saw. And so it's like, why even call it the same thing? All right, so here we are. A unique and novel challenge to global health. We conducted the first double blind randomized placebo controlled trial to evaluate the effect, effect of prophylaxis with probiotic LGG on development of COVID-19. It's like I'm giving it chicken box. Symptoms in exposed household context. While limited in the sample size, our study suggests that there, LGG is well tolerated and is associated with prolonged time to develop a uh, development of COVID-19 infection, reduced symptomatic disease and changes in the gut microbiome structure. So therefore further trials are warranted. But it was positive. Uh, they had great data in reference to the, uh, uh, throughout the heart, entire area here. Um, uh, see, here's the 15 incidents of gastrointestinal side effects. Uh, uh, basically, just really cool stuff. And it seems to have a solid benefit. But there, that's, so as far as a tool, again, the link will be there to the full study as well. And once it renders in 4K, I'll have it bookmarked. This way you don't have to listen to everything you don't want to listen to. You can go straight to it. And therefore, it's not like watching one of the other primary TV channels. All right, here we go. Uh, effectiveness of Kirkman Kirk on outcome of hospitalized COVID-19 patients is, uh, I want to say systemic, a systematic review of clinical trials. It seems like digestion as well as anything that tends to reduce inflammatory compounds seems to be a, a pretty much like uh, high probability that it can yield some benefit uh, per se, obviously through the nature of uh, how SARS-CoV-2 affects the immune system. But here we go. Six studies which were identified showed that curcumin uh, supplementation led to a significant decrease in common symptoms, duration of hospitalization, and deaths. In addition, all of these studies show that the intervention led to amelioration of cytochrome storm effects through the driving force in severe COVID-19 cases. This was seen as significant, obviously p-value, I like to see confidence interval too, but still that's cool. Decrease in pro-inflammatory cytokines, such as interleukin-1b and interleukin-6, with concom concomitant, significant, concomitant, I, now I can't pronounce it. Increase in anti-inflammatory cytokines, cytokines, yeah, it's like a snow cone. Cytokines, including interleukin-10, interleukin-35, and, and TGF, Alpha. Taken together, these findings suggest that curcumin exists its beneficial effects due to at least partial restoration and pro-inflammatory, anti-inflammatory balance. In conclusion, curcumin supplementation may offer an efficacious and safe option for improving COVID-19 disease outcomes. We highlight the point that future clinical studies of COVID-19 disease should employ larger, obviously, to get a better power rating on the study. Let's go down, see if we have any highlights. Do, 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 do. There is the reduction in mortality. You could read that if you like. And um, that's 3.4 right there. And that's usually what most people are looking at right off the bat. 
Uh, and then we go down here. Here we are shown that curcumin treatment as an adjunct therapy helps restore the balance between the pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory pathways and at the same time reduces the persistence of common COVID-19 symptoms and decreases mortality. Together, these findings support curcumin formulations as an adjunctive therapy to reduce the hyper-inflammatory effect of COVID-19 patients and improve patient outcomes. Here is the caveat. <laughs> well, look at this right here. See? If you want to... Um, yeah, this is always amazes me. If you, the availability of some of this, well, it's just the spike proteins, but still just the same. However, analogs of curcumin and formulations such as adjuvants, nanoparticles, liposomes, mycelas, and phospholipid complex have been used to improve the bioavailability. So the researchers are coming in here and they're questioning, saying, hey, you can take your curcumin, but the bioavailability uh, may have its limitations. But there are ways to enhance that viability, and, and some manufacturers have gone with that. Second, Different curcumin formulations were tested, which did not allow direct comparison across the studies. Five of the investigations used two different doses of curcumin, and this gives you the dosages they use. And the reason I'm bringing this up here is not to create confusion, but to give you context in which to draw your own conclusions. You know, piperines, black pepper, and so on and so forth, and there you have it. So really kind of cool. If you think about it, curcumin, and then you have... Uh, Lactobacillus uh, rominus, that's be the Lactobacillus rominus, and that they utilized. Or, and so you have a couple of good tools out there. Out of, out of all the other tools we covered, from bromelain, licorice, so on and so forth, which would be wonderful, wonderful venues to uh, research, just in case uh, some inoculation strategies have been overhyped. All right, and here we go. Next, bum bum bum. Intense meditation brings robust immune system activation. Now I'm usually, when I hear meditation, I look, uh, but you know what? If it's good and it works and it's as promising as what these researchers done, it's actually really kind of cool. Here we go. Eight days of intense meditation cause robust activation of the immune system. University of Florida researchers and their colleagues have found out. And you go down here, doo -doo -doo. when researchers compare interferon gene activity in the retreat participants and severely ill COVID-19 patients. The differences were stark. Meditation activated 97% of interferon response genes compared with 76% gene activation in mild COVID-19 patients and 31% in severe COVID-19 patients. So you see what's interesting here. The gene activation especially in reference to interferon genes, is not being activated in, is, uh, adequately in cases of severe COVID. And in mild, it's being a little bit better. So it tends forth mild. But in those that meditate, 97% of interferon response genes. That is just amazing. They also observed the opposite trend of inflammatory inflammation singling genes. When they saw significantly high levels of inflammatory genes in severe COVID-19 patients compared with mildly ill patients and no change in inflammatory genes after meditation. Likewise, meditation produced beneficial gene activity comparable to conventional interferon treatments given to multiple sclerosis patients. Likewise, I have to reiterate this, meditation produced beneficial gene activity comparable to conventional interferon treatments given to multiple sclerosis patients. Please forgive me about that not being able to draw a straight line, but there it is. That is just, I want to, astounding. Taken together, the findings support the idea that meditation contributes to potentially improving multiple health conditions, the researchers concluded. That is amazing. I mean, I was always reluctant to go on into the meditation thing. And again, it's my personal bias and something I have to get over, uh, but because I have a hard time sitting still. But still, just the same, my meditation is more like in running and exercising and things like that. But however, though, comparable to conventional interferon treatments, that is just an amazing, amazing accomplishment. So that's something to keep in mind as well. So you have your curcumin, you have your lactobacillus ruminus, and you have your meditation. All right, then proceed. This is kind of an interesting thing too. Now, again, this is a medication. And still, just the same, the medication held tremendous promise, except it had a hard time 
actually being absorbed. And the researchers just did a simple twist to the pH and they made a very, very effective uh, nasal spray and throat spray that needs to be researched. Trying to predicate that needs to be researched, but let's proceed. In recent years, however, uh, researchers have been testing niclosamides, niclosamides, and right there is that, niclosamides, potential to treat a much wider range of diseases such as many types of cancer, metabolic diseases, rheumatoid arthritis, systemic, there is that word, sclerosis, and recent laboratories in cells have shown the drug to, uh, to be a potent antiviral medication, inhibiting a virus's ability to cause disease by targeting the energy supply of the host cell, the virus co-ops for its self-replication. So it cuts it off. So it can't, rep so it can't reproduce. And it proceed forward. Do, do, do. Niclosamide, however, is not easily dissolved in to water-based liquids that can be sprayed into a person's nose and mouth. The drug's normal attainable solution concentration at nasal pH of around 6 or 7 is close to, or even less than, what the benchmark suggests is required to stop the virus from replicating in cells without protective mucus. And they found, or he found, that raising the solutions pH to a slightly alkaline pH of 8, acceptable for nasal spray, can dissolve enough, enough of the niclosamides to meet the requirements of his calculations and raising the pH to 9.2, which is still tolerable for a throat spray, beats the benchmark by 10 times and more can be used early in infection. So keep an eye out on that. You know, we've been head on from everything from ivermectin to, the, you know, to everything else since then. And um, it's just so keep an eye on niclosamide. And then, what was the name of the gout medication that was incredible too? Um, you know, it's just, it's there and it's, it's ready. And, you know, if you could keep on using inoculations and facial coverings and you can enjoy the world of dysbiosis, dysbiosis. We're going to get into that in a second too, because that's my hypothesis in reference to why the IQ is dropping so fast during the pandemic, but dysbiosis. All right, so here we go. Next, da da da. Boosted dose mRNA vaccine. All right, went through this, and the results of the study reported the journal cell indicate that the traditional dosing re regimes are do not produce antibodies capable of recognizing and neutralizing the Omicron variant. So, for all you manufact manufacturers, well, you might as well. For all you companies out there, and especially my friends in the military, uh, yeah, uh, that's what it says. So, great job, command. Next, after that, considerable escape of SARS, CV-2, Omicron, antibody. Again, I like redundancy, but here we go. We examined sensitivity of non-monoclonal antibodies, clinically approved and developed into antibodies in present in 115 serum. People affected with COVID-19 vaccine recipients or convalescent individuals. Omicron was totally or partially resistant to neutralization by all tested. Sarah from Pfizer and AstraZeneca vaccine recipients sampled five months after complete vaccination, barely inhibited Omicron. Sarah from COVID-19 convalescent patients collected six to 12, or 12 months post symptoms displayed low or no neutralizing activity against Omicron. Administration of Pfizer booster dose as well as vaccination previously infected generated an anti-Omicron neutralizing response with teeters. Six, so it did it, but it, it sucked. Six to 23 fold lower against Omicron than Delta. So all those mandates out there, oh, get the booster, da, 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 whatever it is. Uh, yeah. Uh, thus, Omicron escapes most therapeutic monoclonal antibodies and to a large extent vaccine elicited uh, antibodies. Again, our selection bias is far superior to their selection bias. And yeah, whatever. Here we go. Help, we looked at that. Selection bias again, once there. Nothing embarrassing, nothing to see here. Nope, nothing at all. Don't even pay attention to that. That's absolutely not worth paying attention to. Here we go, the next. Yep, nothing to see here either. No sense doing it. Just keep on doing your virtue signaling and you'll be fine. All right, here we go. The test, the rapid antigen test. Let's get to this aspect and then we'll get to the punchline. Based on viral load transmissions confirmed through epidemiological investigation, most Omicron cases were infectious for several days before being detectable. So, meaning the people being tested, all right, they're infectious because Omicron has a much earlier infection stage, but the rapid test doesn't detect it. 
So here you are, you go into your workplace or whatever it is, and you're fully inoculated on up and everything else like that, and you're doing your best. And then Omicron hits and you get your rapid antigen test or whatever it is, or you're not inoculated. I don't know if it makes a difference anymore. And so you come out clean or you get on an airplane or whatever it is. So you have people running around fully affected, uh, you know, whatever it is, shedding viral particles or whatever it comes down to be uh, in closed spaces all over the world. And the test is not detecting it. So it gives you a false sense of security, kind of like the favorite thing of despots. But let's proceed forward just in case. Da, da, da. This is the results. All right, the same thing. We just look at the full study. On day zero and one, all, the, I'm not all, as in all, like everyone, rapid energy tests produced false negative results. Despite 28 of the 30 pairs, and 30 pairs are actually people, having infectious viral loads within the range of confirmed Omicron transmissions in the cohort. And what does that look like? It looks like this. I'll show you real fast. All right, so you see right here, remember in the beginning, each one of these lines represents following a person. And so here's all the people which are infectious, and they're false negative. And but they're infectious. And then day four, four days later, after three days of um, you know sharing the love, then basically boom, now the test, the rapid test works out. So the rapid test only seems to work uh, about three to ten days out, and it appears to miss almost all except for this one outlier there on day two of true positives. And that looks like, let's see, something down here. I mean, that's the test. And that's what you're restricting people's movement and freedom of movement on. And yeah, and if it's not working, why? We found that the rapid energy test lagged the ability to detect COVID-19. It's got to be a better acid test first. I mean, I'm a big freedom advocate and self-determination and so on and so forth. It's got to be you know, a better acid test. Even if the Supreme Court kicks in and says, all right, you can't mandate vaccines and everything else, it's been two freaking years. Talk about dragging your feet on constitutional protections. Useless. We found that rapid antigen test lagged on the ability to COVID-19 during the early period of disease. I'm not mumbling, sorry. We're infectious with Omicron and four transmissions were confirmed. So they were infectious. They tested negative, but they still transmitted. The policy implication is that rapid antigen tests may, probably a huge understatement, may not be f as fit for purpose in routine workplace screening to prevent asymptomatic spread of Omicron compared to prior variants. Meaning asymptomatic, meaning uh, you don't you feel fine, but you're spreading it. But, it, you know, ironically, you're going to have a lot of individuals which probably don't feel fine, they're going to get tested, it's going to have negative, and they're still going to go to work. So maybe stop the test after a while and just go down to say, how do you feel? And if you don't feel good, then don't go to work. Maybe that's what it is. You know, hmm? you know, that type of thing. All right, let's proceed forward. COVID-19 Omicron resistance to most mono... Oh, another one. This goes on and on and on and on. Again, redundancy. And here we go. The scientists observed the blood of patients previously infected with COVID-19 collected up to 12 months after symptoms and that if individuals received two doses of Pfizer and AstraZeneca vaccine taken five months after vaccination, barely neutralized the Omicron variant. But the serial individuals who received a booster of Pfizer analyzed one month after the vaccine uh, remained effective against Omicron. But here we go. Remember, the other one we just read was 6 to 23 or something like that. This is 5 to 31 times more antibodies nevertheless were required to neutralize Omicron. So... I don't know what they mean by effective, but not enough. You know, effective, but need a few more. So does that mean you get five to 31 more inoculations? You know, what is that? Seriously. Compare with Delta in cell culture assays. These results help shed light on the continued efficacy of oops, vaccines. And it's like the most passive aggressive way of saying that it like sucks. The results shed light on the continued efficacy of vaccines or protecting against severe forms. Well, maybe that's, I take that back. It's, uh, yeah, it's not going to do anything. 
but vaccines were not approved for this because if they're leaky and gosh forbid you should have you know some sort of uh, antigenic drift or leaky vaccine or increased viral fitness that's only gonna last so long because unless you eliminate the the contagion off the bat and there's no more COVID of any sort of SARS anywhere then the viral fitness will just continue to increase and um you know even though viruses tend to want to become more transmissible and then after become more transmissible they become less um uh, harmful so which is the natural evolution which i know the inoculation proponents were trying to take advantage of basically what happens anyways in nature but to proceed but the real part about it is the negative vaccine effectiveness we covered last week in reference to the inoculated which is a really strong uh, disconcerting uh, effect of potential imprinting uh, immune imprinting which we really don't want to see uh, and I don't, I don't want to be right about immune imprinting because that has massive implications in the future all right let's see here it goes acute mode we covered that all right so let's go to the next one auxiliary lympha lymphadenopathy or an ultrasound after COVID-19 vaccination and influencing factors a single center study quote we included 413 patients uh 49 percent 49 percent whom showed auxiliary lymphadenopathy on ultrasound after COVID-19 vaccination conclusion COVID COVID-19 COVID-19 vaccine related auxiliary lymphadenopathy Lymphadenopathy, I have to pronounce so many different words, on uh, ultrasound is common. It was said uncommon initially, but it is common. An interval of four weeks, uh, younger age and first dose with important factors. Breast clinicians should be well aware of these side effects when performing imaging examination and provide accurate information to patients. Meaning, what they're saying, yeah, this may be happening. If a person's getting tested, uh, you know, let them know ahead of time at least. Go, hey, you know, number one, I don't know what effects that's going to have in the future, regardless. You know, they're saying, well, you know, the vaccine works, it starts killing off the viruses, and lymph nodes get swollen. That's that's a that's a a good hypothesis, but I need to see that proven. But regardless, uh, people going for cancer screening afterwards, maybe uh, not the best time to do it, or if they're going to screen them. Uh, at least let them know that this could be a potential um, false flag. In clinical trials of the vaccine, auxiliary swelling or tenderness was reported in 11 to 16% of patients, let's say 12 roundup, following the first and second dose. Retrospectively, further clinical detected lymphadenopathy was reported in 1.1% of patients within two to four days after the vaccine. So you see the confounding there. They said about four weeks. They, they looked at two, point, two to four days. For the Pfizer uh, biotech, the biotech vaccine, the rate of lymph lymphadenopathy was 0.3%. That was the reported amount, all right? And what did it actually really end up being? When you have a trial that far off, that far off, from 0.3 to 49%, yeah, I, got, I, got, I have some issues. All right, and there we are. Go down, 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 down. Now is the, the, the gist of the study. Now for the one that's most concerning to me. And the, dis, uh, the concern is a reference to the cognitive ability of for whatever reason. Uh, now they can say it's stress. That's what they're implying here of the pandemic. But this is having major impact. And doesn't mean they had COVID or even tested positive for COVID before. Let us proceed ahead and you'll see exactly what I mean. We were surprised to find absolutely, absolutely no signal suggesting that exposure to COVID while in utero was linked to neurodevelopment deficits. Rather, being in the womb of a mother experienced the pandemic. Being in the womb of, the mo of a mother experiencing the pandemic was associated with slightly lower scores in such areas as motor, and social skills, though not in others, such as communication and problem solving skills. The results suggest that the huge amount of stress felt by pregnant mothers during this unprecedented time may have played a role. Now, I have a thing about speaking in past tense because it's, it hasn't stopped yet. 
And that's the problem. Now, when you have the development tra trajectory, uh, they're starting off, uh, pandemic babies are starting off with a negative, uh, you know, a n the, uh, they're, they're behind the starting line, far behind the starting line. They have great, they're going to have greater challenges. Uh, no differences were found in scores between infants who were exposed to COVID-19 in utero, those born during the pandemic whose mothers did not contract COVID-19 during pregnancy. However, average scores among infants born during the pandemic, whether the mothers had COVID during pregnancy or not, were lower than the gross motor, fine motor skills, and social skills of 62 pre-pandemic infants born at the same hospital. Now, my concern is two things. One is dysbiosis. Dysbiosis is basically the disruption of the microbiome. And microbiomes are more than just basically homogenous within an individual. They are also basically very important in regard to the environment. Now, oversanitation uh, is basically you're, you're, you're creating an antibiotic effect on the environment now for two years. Uh, and that bacteria in the environment is extremely vital for basically appropriate development. They're saying stress. I'm saying potentially dysbiosis. Worst case scenario, worst case scenario that we could be having is if we're so focused on SARS-CoV-2 that there's not something else circulating around, which is a lot more subtle, that doesn't create an outward appearance of um, illness that could be playing a role. Because when we look at this study here, impact of COVID-19 pandemic and early childhood cognitive development. This was back in October. And what do we have here? Scroll down just to show you. Uh, just to give you an idea of how bad it's been impacting the in intellect. Across, whoops, across all measures, we found cognitive scores were significantly reduced during the pandemic by 27 to 37 points, or almost two full standard deviations. That is terrifying. To me, that is the true crisis in play. Now, you want to continue with the lockdowns and everything else and the masking and all things which are basically are adverse to proper neurological development. Uh, Every mitigation factor you play has collateral damage. I don't think we have any clue uh, how much collateral damage has already been done on literally an entire uh, generation. But I wanted to bring this to attention. I'll, I'll, I'll send links to the study as well. I think it resulted in a 22 point drop in IQ uh, from pandemic babies. And it's also important too that it basically um, uh, parents know what challenges lie, lie ahead so they can help mitigate it, you know, with healthier diets uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, but it's like in the work we provide early evidence suggesting a significant reductions in attained cognitive function and performance in children born over the past 18 months. And of course, understanding these factors are critical to helping ensure uh, affected children rebound as the pandemic winds down and they reenter daycares and schools and so on and so forth. When was this again? This was, and I'm, so, so, I'm just shocked that policymakers are freaking blind to this stuff. It's criminal. And this was, I, I, not to parse any words on that, it is criminal, uh, was back in October. And of course, now once again, it is reconfirmed again back in January. And it has nothing apparently to do with catching COVID. Something to really think about. All right, to proceed forward. All right. This is the black queen rule. And all I want to do basically is look at this aspect. So the black queen rule is what they're, what they're implying is that with SARS, it's actually not dropping. Uh, it's dropping not genetic advantages. It's dropping unnecessary uh, features uh, per se in favor of having more of, I don't want to say symbiotic, more like a parasitical effect on the environment. So if something else in the environment is doing its job for it, instead of having a redundant doing its job as well, 
like I made the uh, analogy to the immune system and inoculation and so on and so forth. You know, obviously inoculation needs the immune system, but if you purely, you know, but you know, if you want a state sponsored immune system, you understand, then you're going to be less likely to, in a hypothetical sense, correlation wise conjecture, less likely to care as much about your personal responsibility in reference to your health, eating well, uh, exercising, taking care of yourself, as opposed to counting on some sort of other medical intervention down the road, which allowed you to that um, deviation from the proper course. Well, I was worried. The average lifetime, basically the viruses they found out in these cases was four, or variants was four months. So you may have Delta for four months, Omicron for four months and so on and so forth. But the way it's evolving is by dropping certain traits uh, to conserve the resources in favor of what else is in the environment. That's just amazing. And again, it's the black queen rule. And now was back in 2011, it was first postulated. And then basically as opposed to the red queen, evolve or die. Well, maybe, you know, there's different directions, but it's interesting. All right, now let's go into our data as follows. Ba, ba, ba. All right, we looked at that. Let's get the mutations out of the way. All right, here we are. So let's see if we can go down here. Just one. I'm in the way. Let's see if I can get all in line there. If it bounces around, we'll find that. It's not even changing. And there it goes. Up there it goes. All right, so here we are. This is basically people fully vaccinated per 100. This is how we break down the data. Uh, and it's actually as of January 1st. But the, today is January 8th and about to turn the 9th. It just happened to be what today is. Uh, and this is total case. This is 0 per 10, vaccinated, 11 per 20, 21 per 30, so on and so forth. And again, I'm really big into observational data. And it's wonderful to have all these brilliant people working on it. Uh, but, you know, I like to stand back and see what the results are. Doesn't mean it's not prone to confounding. I'm not trying to say they're not right. I'm just trying to say the data as presented, unless it could be explained, maybe less testing, higher seroprevalence, whatever it is, uh, doesn't really support much. And here we are, for example, new cases smooth per million. And what do you notice? And these are the countries which are highly obviously vaccinated. And look at this. Oh, it's, it's actually actually outside the x-axis. This is, um, so we're at 800. Let's see if we can change that real fast. Let's see if we go to 900. Where are we at there? It may black out. If it does, it's okay. All right, there it goes. That was fast. Nope, still not high enough. Hang on one second. Let's, let's make it higher. You can see what's happened here is basically I, there's so many new cases. It's it's outside the uh, the y-axis. So let's try it's like Let's see right here. If I can get an idea. And give it a second. There it goes. Da, da, da. Always worry about a freezing. Yeah, so it's way. <laughs> ready to check this out. Here it goes. Let's look at this. This is amazing. This is how I come again. Does doesn't you know? At, at, everyone says, "Oh, it's follow the science." I am science. I don't care who who you are. Does that support your argument or not? Look at that. Check that out. So new new cases move per million. All right, and pretend you're an alien from a an alien from a foreign planet. That sounds like really bad. Let's let's say you're not from Earth. All right, whatever it comes down to be, and you have to look at the data. And you had no virtue signaling whatsoever. You didn't have to worry about your neighbor's thought or you're losing your job if you question something or whatever it is. You know, imagine freedom of speech, something cool like that. All right, and all of a sudden you look at this data and you're going, all right, should I implement this policy or not? Or are they just crazy people? Um, reproduction rates? You know, it's just like, wait a second. This is what I look at on a regular basis. You know, and I'm going, huh? All right, let's say, let's give one second. There we go. Let's see what we have here. Correlation. That's the correlation between uh, people fully vaccinated and total cases per million. It's correlation, correlation, correlation is not causation. And let's scroll down to do, do, do this, this, and we showed this right off the bat. Remember that? That's the scatter matrix. And you could see the, the pattern there. And then these are the countries which are super vaccinated. Da, 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 da. And then we scroll down, and here we are. Let's look at this. So we notice any patterns, just pick it real fast. These are the countries which are fully vaccinated per 100. There's United Arab Emirates, Portugal, Singapore, so on and so forth. Uh, new deaths smooth per million. Let's see right there. 
We got a little high there towards the end, which is then I was fully vaccinated. But I'm looking for any sort of solid correlation, like breakthrough saying this is science and this is this is it. Um, remember, lower vaccinated on this end, higher vaccinated on this end. Uh, let's look at positivity rate, just for fun. Oops, sorry about that. Son of a gun. Yeah, I'm done clicking. There's your positivity rate. Uh, you know, you know, whatever. And then let's look at new cases, smooth million. Since that seems to be a really big thing. Remember that mostly vaccinated on this side. Chat, look at that. It's like, wait a second. Uh, that's just, that's not a data anomaly. That's, that's backed up over and over again. Unless you want to start, that's, that's amazing. And you could say more testing or whatever it is. Well, that's, that, I could see it with one or two countries, but not, not that whole thing. Not, not this slanted. Seriously. It's like, all right, and I know you guys at Google and YouTube and everything else like that. And it's like, um, you're all data analysts, most of you, regardless of that. And you got to really, really uh, talk to your bosses because I know they mandate it at your company. Um, but it's okay to be wrong. What's not okay is if you're wrong and you, and you keep on doing the same wrong thing because ego. All right, and then again, how are we going here? Let's see. Give it a second. Da, 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 fully vaccinated per 100. And there they are. See, they all follow the line. Let's scroll down. And Singapore deaths per million. Nice to see a drop like that. Remember, we'll worry up with the vaccine, but then it's dropping because of Omicron. And then Belgium, same thing. Mortality has dropped quite significantly, even though the vaccine rate's high. Positivity rate, Singapore. They're doing some reporting, even though it's kind of sloppy. Belgium, look at that positivity rate. They have all these massive lockdowns and things like that. Yeah, talk about angering the population. Uh, cases per million, look at that. Whatever happened here? Boom. It's like, there goes Delta. Boom. Then it goes Omicron. Boom. And then we scroll down. Da, da, da. Oh, look at this. Do we have it, have it here? Oh, no. We'll come back to this in a second. Um, yeah, because Noida has our sequences. Our sequences didn't pop up. We we're going to uh, check out what the new variant is, but what? the heck happened here that should have just ran down hang on one second let's take a chance here i'm gonna pause it real fast pause all right it's running now let's see if i can go down here i wanted to show you the variance here it goes let's chase it there it is look i didn't know what color was gonna pop up but look at this now there's something new popping up the non who you see that and place like netherlands and so on and so forth the, um, obviously, Omicron is that color. And you can see this is as of January 5th, the reporting. Poland did not get the lead this time. But however, though, there you are. And there's Bangladesh. There's a percentage of sequences, so on and so forth. Uh, United States is now at 80% of the sequences are Omicron. So much for all those travel restrictions and bans. United Kingdom's at 95.91. Now, keep in mind... Mortality rate seems to be less. Let's pull it out. And where is Delta among these new places? Uh, Mexico. Look at that. Even though Mexico, obviously being adjacent to the United States, why is Mexico at 100% Delta? And the United States is at 80%, and yet we're neighbors. Think about that for a second. Hmm. All right. And then, of course, down here, this was uh, December 27th. And there was Omicron popping up. And there it is. Wow. Look at that massive difference with the, uh, the countries coming in reporting. Isn't that something else? And then now we got this to worry about. What is that? And why is it in Sri Lanka? And why is it in the Netherlands? All right. The small amount of sequences, but still just the same. It's intriguing. And that just gives you an idea. We followed the history of that for quite some time. All right. Then we're going to go to, oh, it's VAERS. Our vaccine adverse event reporting database, it's now one full year. So how did we end up? Now, don't pay attention to this because it's obviously today's date, but it was the January 1st. If we look at this date right here on VAERS, uh, let's let's see. Do, do, do. We're not downloading anything, but I want to show you. All right, here we are. See, right here. So VAERS ended its database perfectly on December 31st. So it's gonna make it so easy to merge. But here, look at the size of your data. 
look at the size of your zip file and what we are doing is comparing to all 30 years prior so keep that in mind there we are and there we are look at this so last year's uh, zip file just quick comparison was 172 megabytes compared to all 30 years prior 122.53 that is a heck of a lot to heck of a lot of reports looks like this for example as you go down the line this is 2021 which will will be scoured through for decades to come data wise and this is all your 30 years prior just to give you an idea and how does that compare once again just to show you as percentage wise oops do it one more time so basically think of it this way this year's vaccine adverse event reporting database is 40 percent larger than the 30 years prior that is a lot of food for thought graphically it looks like this there's 2020 there's your other years prior that's 2021. there's a lot of explaining to do and a lot of data to go through and i and then mandating things and things like that when you see this giant red sun appearing um yeah i want to see i want to see the rationale in that all right and let's see let's go this way do 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 the mutations went uh your dura vigilance did not update yet it's been seven days there's been no update on the european database in regard to reactions nor anything so european database has just not updated at all uh so let's we'll come back to that a little bit later on and then the VARES rebuild i want to go through the disclaimer real fast uh because it's important so whoops now we're proxy whatever that is but the VARES database basically look at that i got nothing coming up wow what wonderful timing all right here we go let's try one more time let's see absolutely nothing well, again, VAERS database per se means these are just reports being made to VAERS. Doesn't mean there's anything going on with it, just they have to be confirmed. And let's look at the data real fast since that seems to be working as far as VAERS not. And so what do we have here? Look at the updated database. These are the individuals which mortality was reported to VAERS uh, throughout the entire year. Remember, remove duplicates. Uh, so these are people that passed away within the day or day after or sometimes even two days later uh after shortly after the vaccine correlation is not causative but again some of these are pretty pretty detailed uh and they sound anaphylactic and they're sad let's keep that in mind those are the ages of individuals that basically i have no clue how this got there uh but still just the same uh, the ages of the individuals with uh, passed away within a day or two after the vaccine. We'll be looking at long range data coming up now that we have a full year. So we look at basically the individuals where mortality had succumbed to the vaccine. And then where basically we could read uh, in regard to what happened in that mortality uh, per se. Uh, that, that I could read that one. They put it out there. I have no clue what they're trying to say, but you can see how there's a lot of work for the CDC uh, to go through. Um, some of them are very, very light in their detective work. Um, some of them are just pretty detailed. Let's see if we can go over to the detailed ones. Like right there, that person was uh, within 20 days. Uh, they began uh you know to succumb and so on and so forth then after this these are people with also with died within 10 days 3053 um you go down the line you can read uh, a lot of it tends to be coronary or heart issues it's i mean really sad stuff but look at the again correlation is not causative but when you randomly choose things and these random things end up being cardiac arrest and things like that at young ages, 
Uh, yeah. Let's proceed forward. These are the non-duplicated reports. You see the spike right here. That's kind of interesting. Uh, in the age group, that age group is right there is between, I'd say 17, right there. So number of reports total was 704,966. I know we had more reports prior, but there appears to have been an adjustment. So we're gonna close out at 704,966 non-duplicated reports. Again, we're gonna reiterate, non-duplicated. Uh, there is our basically uh, total mortality was reported to VARES was 9,762. I know a lot of reports are much higher, but let's see if I could show you for a second what the, the error is. If we go to the top and you see, for example, mortality, you see that number right there? Uh, let's see if I can get that one's even higher. It's always gonna be a little higher. So you have to basically remove uh, the duplicates. If you don't remove the duplicates, uh, you're gonna get a false thing. Why do you have duplicates? Because sometimes an individual has so many symptoms that um, that they require three or four different ports to fill it out. So then being 20, you know, so if they require four ports that could be misconstrued as being four more separate mortalities. When in reality it's one mortality requiring four reports. These are the long range targets we're looking at as far as mortality uh, that have not passed away within a day, but have been associated with a report to VAERS. And again, there's some oddity there. I don't know why. Uh, once again, let's go to this one. This is myocarditis. And I'm showing here in this myocarditis one, I didn't show, but I'm showing 206 uh, reported deaths on myocarditis at a 3, 1,840 reports. We'll get more reports a little bit later on. Uh, but just to give you an idea, per se, children. I have a hard time with this one. This is mortality reported to bearers. Uh, again, these are non-duplicated reports and they may change as time goes on. So you find a lot of these ages are young and they're being administered vaccines which at that time was in an appropriate age, but it may have resulted in such an issue. Um, you know, down the line, these are younger and younger and you're looking at the ages per se, and that tends to be pretty intriguing as to why at five years of age. Um, and then you look at some of the ages right here. Uh, look at common things. You'll see a couple of suicides, but however though, a lot of it, again, tends to be, you know, cardiac per se. Um, why? Let's look at 18. Yeah, a lot of them associated with chest pains. And in, you know, obviously they need just weird things like that. But the real reports, the real reports need to be validated. All right, and down the line, let's go finish up with basically how we're doing in the United States. Do, do, and here we go. Give it a second to change pages. And this is the average age of mortality. Uh, still in the U.S. Yep, there we are. Uh, not a lot in the youth, even though we're t torturing our youth. And obviously you can see, for example, as we described before, in these young ages, uh, affecting as far as neural uh, development, cognitive development. Uh, these are the people which are succumbing. No one seems to have, uh, I don't want to make sound crass, but old age doesn't seem to be a factor in mortality anymore. Uh, let's see, here it goes. And this is the average age of mortality in reference to, uh, or the ages of mortality, most common ones in reference to COVID. Scroll down. And I wanna look at basically one last thing. And this is all our hospital admissions. I don't have it in a way which is easy to read there. Let's see how we go this way. Scroll down, scroll down. This is what our mortality rate was on April 18th. 3.05. This mortality rate is on January 4th. So looking about 2.85, sorry, right there. 2.97, 3.08, uh, and we're with Omicron. So I'm not seeing a massive advancement in reduction in mortality. Let's see how Florida's doing. 
Look at this. Remember that? And this is new death smooth per 100,000. Now, check this out. Let's go the other way. Look at the Omicron. Right there. Look at the Omicron. Look at that. Florida is way higher in cases. Texas, and New York, and so on and so forth. And here's where the confounding comes. So here you have Omicron like super, super high in basically Florida. How is the mortality? Look at that. Mortality is about 1.80 in Texas, uh, 1.95 in New York, 0.79 in California, but Florida, 0.12. Now, if you had to draw a conclusion, 0.12, all right, yet Florida, look at that, has the highest new cases per million. Look at that spike in all of them. You see that? It just go up, 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 up. Yet, down, 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 down. So if you want to continue to say this is a state of emergency, and the objective was obviously to flatten the curve, um, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just not, look at that. Look at that. That's all the states together. I'm not a fan of the strategy. I just, I think it's, um, Archaic, I think was may have been a good strategy in the beginning, but since that point of time, I just think now the collateral damage from, you know, being a two footed driver is basically what our bureaucratic establishment is. Um, and then sticking with tools that worked one time and then using the same tool uh, when you need to use a hammer to to basically strike a nail. We're still using a saw to try to still strike a nail, and we're determined to make that saw work. So I don't know if that's quick, uh, exactly the most sane approach. And let's wrap it up. To what do we cover today? Ba -ba -ba, da -da -da. There, there it comes up. Yeah, well, now it's useless to me. But the various disclaimer we covered going backwards. Do, 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 do. The Black Queen effect, actually dropping some genetic redundancy in favor of focusing on other issues, uh, per se. Uh, the impact in COVID-19 development, uh, this is just to reiterate from the ar article from in, uh, October, of a massive cognitive drop in children born during the pandemic uh, that had nothing to do with exposure to COVID-19. Again, I'll leave you to speculate. Again, to be re uh, reiterated again and repeated on January 4th, 2022. Uh, disconcerting on a many different scales. Then after that, it has to be addressed. You just can't ignore it. Uh, lymphode uh, lymphadenopathy, lymphadenopathy, yeah, lymphadenopathy, denopathy, auxiliary, auxiliary, auxiliary. Uh, much more common than uh, than actually in the trials. Interesting. Uh, then pancreatitis. I'm start looking out for. I'll start uh, punching that into the um, the various data frames. Then basically we covered. Doo -doo -doo, um, well, obviously, just it's a reiteration. Three solid studies basically saying, hmm, uh, that sorry, but the two shots ahead of time didn't quite do the job. Rapid antigen test, antigen test, probably more dangerous to have a rapid antigen test than not to have one. Uh, when you have a false positive rate of almost 90% or 100%, uh, what did you think? Do you think you would rely upon when you have a rapid antigen test to help mitigate your pandemic in, re in regard to the uh, uh, the du jour of the day or the pathogen of the day, Omicron? Maybe against D614G, but an Omicron, and then people go, oh, I'll just use the PCR test. Well, PCR tests, you can get false positives left and right, just a little bit of weak acid uh, to mess with the buffering agent. All right, discordant debt. There it goes. We want that. That's the the abstract. Uh, yeah, that's pretty uh, intriguing. And that's just plain. Uh, I'm not going to say anything negative. All right, then there after that. Uh, then we go to considerable escape of SARS. Yep, reiteration. Uh, reiteration, redundancy, just so we're not just selecting by just one outlier study. Uh, and then we go to niclosamide. Looks promising. Good. Very cool. I'm really into prophylactic treatments because they appear to actually do something against the variants. 
as opposed to still using the same outdated inoculation. And then basically we have meditation. Again, I'm surprised myself. And that's actually really incredibly, incredibly cool. Uh, then after that, uh, we have curcumin, wonderful, common, again, focused towards the absorption, seems to be a biggie, but I'll have the link for the study as well. And it gives you an example of a, the types they use and the dosages. I'm not making any recommendations, but nor for the sake of um, basically understanding more of the study. There it is. All right, then basically after that, Lactobacillus ruminus, uh, real powerful, real positive in regard to that as far as probiotics once again. And I'm not a brand name dropper, but I I don't care. If it helps people, it helps people. It helps people get better and feel better and conduct in life on a normal basis, regardless of the bureaucratic um, uh, whatever pandemic mitigation strategy in play that seems to be totally blind to the real world. But outside of that, I am for Lactobillus ruminus, and I am for curcumin, and I am for, yeah, meditation, and I am for nicolosamide. Uh, I'd love to see the studies done on this to basically validate it. And if these get validated to be beneficial, then it may not just be it may be beyond what we do here. It may help with other things too, provided the studies pan out. Again, Ralph Trigiano signing off once again. Gratitude. Thank you. And look forward to you all once again next week. And just food for thought. I want to leave you with this. Let's see if it comes up. You ready? Because it would be fun to look at this next time too. Not, I Don't I, take me back. Not fun. Uh, but, you know, it's intriguing as far as where it goes. And here we go. We're waiting, 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 waiting. There it is. And we'll look at, this is what a scatter matrix is for. And, da, 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 yes. I will leave you with this. Food for thought. All right, all. I will catch you next time. And thank you. See you then.